Hello, everybody. Welcome to the readings from Akana Milwaukee virtual event series. Um, with that said, I pass you over to my partner, Lisa Bedoin, from the fabulous Books and Company in Akana Milwaukee. Hi, thank you. Hi. 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 So my feeding back, and I get to introduce um, our author today, Robert Lloyd, who has his degree in the history of ideas, which I think is kind of an awesome thing to have your degree in, He, um, where he wrote his thesis on Robert Hooke, and if you have not read the book, then you will soon find the wonders of, of wonders of Robert Hooke. He is also a landscape painter and has taught secondary school for 20 years, which also, I think, influences this writing and this novel quite a bit. His parents worked in the British Foreign Office, where he is. Um, they live between South London, Innsbruck, and Kinshasa. He makes it makes absolute perfect sense to to have this adventure and this eye for detail. And now we're talking about his new novel, The Bloodless Boy, that pulls in all of those bits of imagination and intrigue and his love of history. So welcome today, Robert, all the way from London, correct? A little bit further. Um... Well, a bit nearer oh. you, actually. It's South South Wales. I, okay, I okay. Um, Sorry, well, South Wales, um, which is very different. But part of Wales called the, the Brecon Beacons, um, just a, a, about an hour north of Cardiff. Okay. And you're going to start today by giving us just a little bit of a flavor of the Bloodless Boy, um, which has been getting really great reviews, and I know I really enjoyed it. So you want to give us a little flavor, read a bit about it, give us sort of a, a reading of the, elevator the, pitch about the story. Okay, well, there, there is the book, um, set up nicely with a, a Lee Child and quote on the front, which I'm very pleased with, I have to say. And the, the elevator pitch, um, uh, as the title suggests, there, there's a, a finding um, on a snowy. Um, January day, um, a, a boy is found drained of his blood on the banks of the Fleet River, uh, and the Justice of Peace, Sir Edmund Berry Godfrey, um, enlists the help of Robert Hooke, who was um, curator of the Royal Society of London, um, and he brings with him Harry Hunt, who was his assistant, uh, and um, he the justice obviously enlists them um, because he thinks that they can help him. The, the, the manner of the boy's death is, um, is complicated and, and mysterious. Um, having done so, um, Harry and Hook are dragged into all sorts of mysteries and adventures and, and mayhem ensues. And it does. And did you want to read a little bit of, from the novel? Oh, yeah. I'll, um, be... th this has been sprung on me a little bit, folks. That there's a passage that a couple of reviewers have, um, have, have drawn attention to. Um, so it must have something. So I'll, I'll, I'll read this. And um, just, just for context, then. The boy has been brought back to Gresham's College, uh, which is where the Royal Society were based. Um, the justice has asked them to store him, to preserve him. Uh, Robert Hooke um, invented, designed um, an air pump, uh, which was uh, able to create some vacua inside a, a glass receiver. So they, they're, they're about to store the boy in the cellars underneath Gresham College. Uh, Harry climbed onto a small stool next to the apparatus and Hook carefully lifted the boy to him. The boy's limbs splayed loosely. Harry perceived with, with a jolt how fragile he was. They balanced him on top of the globe and Hook reached up to assist Harry in lowering the legs through the aperture. Harry held them by the shins, feeling they would snap from the pressure of his fingers. The flesh was a soft, milky colour. Distaste rose again in his throat, and he castigated himself for it, being careful not to betray his squeamishness to Hook. He dropped the boy's feet into the receiver. The knees went in, and then, with a squeeze through the aperture, the thighs and pelvis. He took the boy under the armpits, repositioned him, 
and deftly finished his stowage inside the glass. He jumped off the stool with a steadying hand from Hook. The slap of his landing reported against the walls of the cellar room, its loudness shocking them both. Each man's concentration on placing the boy into the receiver had transported him into a dreamlike state in the solitude and silence deep under the college. With his back following the curve against the glass, the boy's head rested on his knees. His arms extended by his sides and his hands resting on the floor of the globe, palms upwards, he looked like a beggar appealing for a coin. There was just enough height to the receiver to be able to replace its lid. Observing the boy's body, Harry became acutely aware of the fabric of his own, conscious of the workings of his stomach and the way his lungs pressed the insides of his ribs. An idea occurred. He was not yet ready to have it scrutinized. Hook opened a box containing a smooth gray paste. The diachylon, we will seal him inside. They spread the diachylon, a blend of olive oil, vegetable stock and lead oxide boiled together into the crack between the receiver and its lid. Next, they prepared a mixture of pitch, which they melted on a small stove kept there in the room with rosin turpentine and wood ash. They smeared it around the stopcock and completed the integrity of the air pump by pouring oil into the valve containing the cylinder to lubricate and seal it. Rotating the handle, Harry drew the piston to the top of the cylinder, then brought it back down the tube with the stopcock opened, sucking air from the receiver into the cylinder. He closed the stopcock, removed the valve and raised the piston back up inside the cylinder. They created a vacuum inside the receiver in this laborious way, repeatedly, the pumping becoming more difficult as it vacated the glass. Each man took his turn at the handle. As the air inside the globe grew thinner, the glass began to groan. Soon the handle required the strength of both. Inside, the boy swayed in protest with the rocking of the machine as they wound its handle. At last, a great creak emanated from the air pump. Enough, Hook declared. Hook inspected the brass cylinder, then the glass, looking through at the huddled figure of the bloodless boy. We are close enough. Just, I have to first I have to unmute. That'll happen like five times, by the way. Um, especially because when I didn't unmute, I'm in the store. So like a call to someone <laughs> to come on the floor came out. Um, he, I, you were obviously very fascinated by Robert Hook. I'd love for you to talk about your inspiration. But I, my first question has to be, was this really a real device or did you make this up? Is this really? The, the air pump, did, did you say, Daniel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was the air pump a real device? Yes. Um, yes, it, it was. He, he was um, Robert Boyle's assistant, and together they, they created the, well, Hook actually um, created it for Boyle uh, in order to um, carry out trials or, or demonstrations and experiments, as we, as we call them now in um, combustion, um, respiration, the, the nature of the air um, and preservation, uh, which, which as you see, is, is a sort of vital um, plot point uh, in, in my book. Um, yeah, the, there's a, a great replica uh, of it in um, uh, the, the Science Museum in, in London. Um, in, in my um, fictional version of it, um, it's, perhaps slightly larger than it actually was in order to, to, to fit the boy in. I, I think he, he, he possibly could have just fitted, but uh, I, I've made it just large enough. I don't think, you know, he probably just didn't realize that he would have been putting a boy in it eventually. So um, yeah. you know, that'll throw off the measurements. Would you like to talk a little they, about- they, they, your... preserved, they, they preserved small animals, cats, and, and dogs and, and birds and, and, and you know obviously they, they obviously they um, uh, conducted experiments in, in respiration where they where they vacated the, the glass of air as, as a bird um, was in and um, you know to, to, to see what they could uh, 
withstand or survive or, or, or at what point they, uh, they expired. So you, you couldn't be squeamish in those days. How long would something last in the, one of the globes? The, in, in practical terms, keeping the, the vacuum was, was a problem. Keep, keeping the integrity of the air pump was, uh, was a problem. But, you know, as, as, as in a, 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 a tin, tinned goods, you know, it would, it would last a, a good long time if the, uh, if the vacuum was, was maintained. Would you like to talk a little about your interest in Robert Hooke that led to the book? I mean, I, I was like, I, I know there's a Hooke's law somewhere. So of course I looked it up and I'm like, no, it's about elasticity, elasticity which and then I didn't understand what the formula meant. So, but he was involved in so many different things. What, like what led him to, was this from yeah, well, your teaching background or? Hooke, um, no, it was uh, it was before I, I became a teacher. I, I, um, I, I've got a, Quite a weird CV, Daniel. So I, I did a fine art degree, um, but I, I, I got very wrapped up in the thesis, um, which was a, about time and, and how time has been uh, used in art, particularly 20th century um, art, um, as, as a material or, or how it's been portrayed or how it's been described. I, I got quite sort of heavily into, um, in, into the history of that and, and that that's what took me on to the MA, which was history of ideas, which, which I, I found this really, as you said, Lisa, you know, a, a cool uh, MA to, to do up in, up in Newcastle. Um, and, and we had a choice. We could either do the 17th century or the 19th century. I, I, I felt that I'd done a fair old bit of the 19th century uh, on my fine art degree with the, with the Impressionists and all that. Uh, so I, I plumped for the 17th century. It was, it was very arbitrary, really, look, looking back. Um, and I was um, researching a character called John Aubrey um, and, and literally found a copy of Hook's diary um, in the, in the uh, university library, um, took it home, started reading it and, and couldn't stop reading it. And I've been reading it um, ever since, sort of 25 years later, I'm, I'm still reading it. Um, when I then decided in, in 2000 to, to start um, writing a book. Um, I, I had the research from, from my MA. Uh, I, I ended up doing my MA thesis on, on Robert Hooke's role in keeping the um, Royal Society going in, in the, in the mid-1670s. Um, it, it really was at a, at a low ebb. And he, he with his um, kind of political maneuverings, um, Kind of rescued the uh, the society and, and ensured its its continuance. He, he was he was very much at the at the centre of, of events in the Royal Society. Um, so I had all this research to um, to to go back to and, and rely on as as I plotted a um, you know I kind of I had the idea I would write a novel and then then stupidly my second idea was what you know what what's it going to be about and, and perhaps it would have solved a few problems or avoided a few problems if I'd, I'd done that the other way around. So I, I kind of, I had a couple of ideas, other ideas as well, but um, but it, it had to be Hook, really. I, I, I knew a fair bit about him. I was fascinated by him. Um, you mentioned Hook's law. He was a horologist, so he, he designed and had watches made and pocket watches. Uh, and obviously you couldn't have a pendulum in a, in a pocket watch it had to be um, governed by by a, a helical spring, and he, he came up with a, um, a a mechanism so that a pocket watch would keep accurate time. Um, and so that that's how his research on, on springs, you know, and his famous uh, Hooke's law that, that we were certainly taught at school. But he, he did so much else besides. Uh, you know, he he was a a forerunner in astronomy, um, micros microscopy. Um, he he developed and and um, uh, improved microscopes and and this this was what led me to the the idea that he would be great um, as a as a kind of investigator in a crime. He he had microscopes and uh, if, if you get the chance to look at micrography or if you, if you never have it, it it's a truly you know, wonderful book with Hook's own engravings in it. Something else he was good at, um, but but I thought it, it would make a great. Um, he would make a great crime scene investigator with it, with his knowledge of the of the very small through his microscopical um, observations that that he'd done. Um, so a, a CSI, seventeenth century London. Um, 
So, so that was the, and that with his air pump and, and the image of a boy inside the air pumps receiver, that, that was where the whole thing started really. Which is really kind of interesting when you, I think about the contemporary art that are looking at time and then the, the, when we, when I was in London, we were at the Tate and I think one of the Damien Hirst um, sculptures with his figures, like I think it was a cow or something or an animal that he preserved. All this sort of ties into the sense of, of that space where science is and that beginning of knowledge. And so what I really enjoyed about the book is, is going back and and seeing at the beginnings of all those ideas and how it all started and came forward. And, and I was constantly Googling and looking things up and learning so much. And so my question in all of that is that, you know, you're in this space where there's um, the continuum of our knowledge and you, and the characters themselves begin to see the, the limitations and the stubbornness of the society that interprets that and and how when you were writing did you see that information compared to where we are today and the repetitiveness of you know the 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 evolution of ideas and the lack of evolution of our ability to move with the ideas the limitations um the the, the book is set against the, the the kind of mass hysteria of the the mm -hmm. popish plots um the, the anti-Catholic feeling that was prevalent at the time um, uh, was um, um, you taken advantage of um, by by well various people, in, including the, um, uh, the the baddies, if you if you like, in in my book, um, and a character called Titus Oates um, fabricated ev evidence. Um, so so there was this kind of um, feeling against the Catholics and Catholics were blamed for, for everything from, you know, causing the plague to the, the great fire of London. And um, um, if a comet went over, you know, the, the, the Catholics would be blamed. I'm, I'm you know, ca caricaturing a little bit there, but um, and so, so, so I, I went, when my book is set, that, that, that background that it's set against is, um, is, is great to, to have a, um, a murder which can be can be scientifically explained new philosophically i should say that with, with the, uh, the the 17th century um, phraseology um and and an investigator that kind of refuses to be swayed the, the justice that, that i mentioned he, he assumes that it is catholic malfeasance and um uh it, it's um it's kind of harry Harry kind of takes over the investigation. It's it's his refusal to be swayed by the the hysteria around him, um, which has kind of become more metaphorically kind of rich um, in in recent um, times. Where when I was writing it, my my angle was far more on on the um, the, the prejudice mm -hmm. against Catholics. I mean, we we had. Uh, obviously, post 9/11, we, we had um, Blair. Um, we we then, when when the Conservatives took over here, we, we had a, a lot of anti-Muslim rhetoric um, published in newspapers. You know, the, the the media was was full of it, and I could I I had this direct parallel. I I could look at things that were being said about um, the, the Muslim population in London or Leeds or Bradford or any of the other major cities in in this country, and, and so well, you know. I, I can I can swap the words over. Obviously, we we've got Northern Ireland as well to look at. I I, I looked at the speeches mm -hmm. of Ian Paisley and um, he he did some wonderful ranting, which which I could um, uh, adapt for, for for my crazy ranter uh, Israel tongue in in the book. Um, so so it was it was much to do much more to do with prejudice when I wrote it. Now I and I think a few other people have, have seen. They, they see it as, as a, you know, in, in a post-Trumpian world and in a, in a COVID um, world, they, they kind of have, have seen the book as um, um, reflecting some of the, um, the, the splits in society that, that we see, the, the kind of refusal to take scientific advice, for, for example, or, or the distrust of government. 
Um, so I think people read it now in a slightly different way than, than they did. Um, how long ago is it? I, I did the self-published version of it seven, eight years ago. But it's just the, the vast scientific um, advancements that we can make and then the, the stubbornness of our own ways to hold us back into accepting other people, which is your nice parallel with the levelers who come mm. in and are looking for that sense of equality. So I don't know, it just yeah. read, you know, it's that point where a historical novel can really teach us so much about history that we may have missed, but also teach us so much about where we're at and, and the importance of learning our history. I think um, it, as, as I wrote the book, it, it took a very long time to, to, to write. I, I wrote it part time around my teaching job and, um, I, and fiddled with it and, you know, procrastinated and well, while so, so it was it was kind of a good 10 years before I felt it was ready to, to send out to to anybody. Um, while while I wrote it, uh, I realized that all the characters are mad in their own way. Um, and and it, that's the kind of the way I, I like to, to look at them, that, you know, and, and, and people people are all mad in their own way and they, they all have their their own um, uh, objectives and, and which they will will follow through and they will reinterpret the world according to their their pre-existing views and, and all my characters do do exactly this which is which is why they behave in the in in the way that they they do uh the the main character harry hunt uh obviously reflects my kind of you know woolly liberalism um and, and he's a he's a modern man if you like in, in thrust into these circumstances um but, but but I like to uh, I, I like to try and be fair to to everybody and and try and understand people. I, I do I do struggle with um, COVID deniers. Uh, my my daughter is a, is an ICU nurse, and uh, when when she comes out after a thirteen hour shift and is and is confronted by people wielding placards um, that, that it's some kind of government conspiracy. Uh, when I know what she's actually been to, I, I, I do lose patience a little bit um, with, with those people. But, but you know, I, I do try and understand why they would would do that, as, as I try and understand the characters in, in my novel. Mm -hmm. Great Britain is yeah back with Omicron, back in the thick of thick of controversy. So I, I assume it's also Wales has had more restrictions placed on again. So. Uh, I love the um, relationship that uh, Hook and um, Harry have. Um, I heard a rumor, and I, I so many places to go with this. Um, whenever you say a sentence, I like. I have seventeen things to questions to ask, but um, I don't think there's enough time or enough, uh, uh, you know, energy on anyone's part. Um, I do. I did hear that you originally wrote the book more from Hook's perspective as opposed to Harry. Did I get that right? that you in your yeah it, um harry which made harry horribly passive he, he was hook's assistant uh, off to do his bidding and he'd go off on another mission and come back and report to hook and hook would suggest something else and harry would go off and um it, it became far more interesting when um uh, harry actually disobeys hook in the uh, in in the book uh, and goes against his his advice uh, harry wants to um, come out from Hook's shadow, I, I suppose, um, and that, that made him a far richer and more interesting character. Uh, also, that, that there were physical um, implausibilities that um, Hook was was pretty hunchbacked by this time. He, he got progressively more and more hunchbacked as he, he grew older. So to have him having fights on top of the monument uh, didn't seem quite. Um, um, plausible whereas Harry could could go off and get himself into all sorts of scrapes and um, when, when he went against Hook's advice so yeah it, it did change in that um, in that sense uh, and they 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 you know they fall out there's tension between them so that, that's intrinsically more more dramatic um, the, the other thing of, of course is that um, as, as their relationship developed in in my mind um, it reminded me more and more of my own relationship with my father so i i, I used that um shamelessly 
um, to to inform the, the the relationship between Harry and and Hook, who who was very much Harry's father figure in in real life as as well as in my book. What what are we living our lives for if not to put them in fiction? So good for you. <laughs> we we are all fiction, Daniel. Yes, yes, we're all fiction. Which you know, when you're using real characters in in a story. Um, that, that there's a sort of strange mental ethics that you you apply to to using people who really existed and, and who had you know real effects upon the world and, and I'm I'm sort of thrusting them into situations that uh, that the real people didn't so so um, that there's a certain amount of squeamishness that comes with that which 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 I find interesting and where I where think, my yeah where where my line is and, and where another author's line is. Um, uh, you know, I've, I've compressed events, I've, I've moved people around, um, and, and I felt little compunction in, in doing so, as long as it fed the, the story. Um, I've, I've changed the nature of a, a character's death, um, and I kind of see it as, or, or maybe I'm just excusing my, my, my reprehensible behaviour, but I, I see it as a, um, you know, a, a cover version of a, of a song. Those people had their lives. Nothing I write 350 years later changes the, the, the fabric and nature of, of the lives that they live. Um, so, so I do feel pretty free to, um, to, to have my fictional versions of, of Hook and, and Harry and Shaftesbury and, and John Locke even um, doing, doing, you know, doing my bidding. Um, and... Um, a few people have raised eyebrows. I, 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 I would like to think that historians of the time would kind of enjoy what I've what I've done and, and see what I've done. I think well, that you know, actually, John Locke was in France at this time, but but I kind of explain things away. Um, when, when I was first writing it, I, I tried to, to steer much more closely to the historical account. Uh, when I thought um, had a eureka moment of thinking. Well, actually, I don't have to. It, it, it really did liberate me. I could, I could um, create a far more interesting story then. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, it does say a novel on the cover, just <laughs> letting everybody know. Which, which is very helpful, yeah. It, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a work of imagination. The, the, um, and and you know to to justify myself, plenty of other people did it. There there are many um, historical novelists who use real characters, um, and and having have them saying dialogue and doing all sorts of things that um, uh, that they didn't actually do. So, I, but but I do find the ethics and morals of it in, interesting. Yeah, um, I I just but, want to mention that both Lisa and I are selling hand hand over fist. So you know, <laughs> just saying. <laughs> Not sure everything in that book actually happened. Lisa, you have so many interesting things to add. Well, and I was going to say too, because this is a, a period in history that I've never really fallen deeply into. And I was like, oh, this is going to be kind of a trick to, you know, am I going to, am I going to be able to do this? And I was delighted and I was searching things online all the time because there was just details and information that I wanted to know more about the character. So by taking the character and creating, keeping their essence, you put them in a new situation and it feels fresh and it makes me want to go back in and learn more. So I say kudos to you for doing that. And in writing that in a time period where there's so many people who are experts in that history, how did you, what did you want the novice to take away from this? And how did you sort of, you know, I guess you talked a little bit about those that already know all of this history, but what did you want somebody who was new to this whole time period to take away? <clears throat> well, um, I'm quite shallow, Lisa. I, I, I like a good thriller. Uh, the, yeah. the main, the main <laughs> thing I, I want them to, to take away is, you know, they, they've been entertained and, and they've been thrilled that, you know, there are fights and chases and, and murders and, 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 you know, an investigation and, and, a, and a, a big reveal at the end. And it's, it's got all of these, these things to it. And um, if, if 
it leads in more then, then that's wonderful maybe they they put it down and you know their, their next book is is the first world war or, or the victorians or the elizabethans you know uh, i think one of the reasons that the the book um was turned down perhaps uh, originally back in 2013 um i had four publishers interested but it, it sort of all fell through it, it, there, there aren't enough books written in this um in this time scale that there are a few and um, andrew taylor recently has, has um, based his series starting from the fire of london so slightly earlier than mine and he's, he's kind of the more books he writes he's kind of catching up with me so i've got to keep uh, i've got to keep ahead of him um <laughs> and so so yeah um i've lost my my thread a little bit there uh, Lisa, yeah. you, I think what you're saying is, um, I use the history context, I want people to love it as a thriller, and if they get more out of it, so much the better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, so the, 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 there's a certain um, sort of richness, hopefully, of, of language, that there's a nod towards the language of the time in, in the book. Um, so, so, so I, I hope they think it's well written. Um, the, the dialogue I've, I've taken quite a lot of care over. Um, hopefully, I, people don't see that as a kind of pastiche of 17th century. Well, uh, um, but it's one of the things, interesting of it. Yeah, I heard that you're, in original drafts, it, it was actually more that you contemporized it a little more um, as you were writing the book, um, which I'm grateful yeah, for. And, and, when, when Melville House um, came, um, you know, offered to publish it very, very kindly, they they asked me to kind of go go back a little bit. I, I think I'd sort of modernised um, um, stuff slightly slightly too much, perhaps. But you you can't you you know how 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 do you say where the line is? So, so I, I had one review that, that said it's written in old English and he couldn't get on with it at all. And it's it's not um, it's not written in, in old English, but it does use a few uh, late seventeenth century words. But um, um, it's yeah, it's um, I'm not sure I'm where I'm going with this one either. Oh, okay. Well, one of the things that I, you know, you, you, you know, it's nearly nine. It's nearly bedtime in the UK. I do know. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yes. We yeah. should sing you. We should give you, so, give you a little, uh, you know, lullaby and get you off your butt. Um, just yeah. maybe a little, a little bit longer. Um, one of the things that somebody said was that they did, you know, we were talking about the omniscient narrator um, with an anachronistic terms just that wouldn't have been the time. And I, it let me the question to ask to you is we know when the characters in the book are set. When is this omniscient narrator telling the story? Is the story is the omniscient narrator of the time or is that omniscient the, narrator going back? Well, yeah, it's it's a sort of it's a, a, a close third person, isn't it? So I, it, it does I, I think of the narrator as a he. Um mm. He, he does switch a little bit uh, with a particular character, but but um, I, I I loosened up the language of the of the narrator. The the, the dialogue is um, is you know a, a, I think a, a readable and reasonable approximation of some of the, the rhythms and um, uh, you know in, in inflections of, of the times and some of some of the words that were used. Um, but now they're they're. Put in as as flavouring rather than the the, the whole meal. I, I think originally I, I really did go to town on, um, you know, and, and I had to sort of apply rules. So, um, words words like betimes, you know, I, I, I don't want my characters saying betimes, but 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 in the seventeenth century, of course, everyone would have said betimes, but it, it just makes it sound slightly too. Uh, Shakespearean or, or early 17th century and this is the latter part of the of the 17th century it has to appeal to a modern reader so so it is it is tricky that one and you know hopefully uh, in, in my mind I've, I've got it more or less right a lot of people think I have some people can't get on with it at, at all and, and that's fine um yeah uh, I, I, I've I read I've read other problem. books yeah I it's a problem with dialect a lot like how much dialect you put like we, I like a little flavor at the beginning and then kind of soften it out so that 
I feel like I'm in the world now. I got it. I got it. This mm. is the way to speak. Um, and yeah. I really appreciate that, um, that, that, that you did actually make that adjustment. It, it's more, yeah, it's more, um, the, the, the rhythm, the rhythm of it's really important. And I think, I think you can, you can use some, um, contemporary to, to them um, terms and, and hopefully take the, the reader with you and, and maybe they'll they'll look up a, a word um, I don't know iatro chemistry or, or a chirurgian um, conflagration and um, you know I've, I've, I've put them in there and left them in there to, to, to give a bit of a flavor of the time but hopefully um, mo most people will will get it from the context or, or, or lose themselves and you know, not worry about it. My, my favorite book is Mervyn Peake's Gormenghast. I, I don't know half the word, well, not half, you know, but there are loads of words in there that um, I've, I've never bothered to look up. I've seen them once and, and, and you know, I, I, I kind of uh, nestle um, in, in the luxury of, of it all and don't worry too much about it. <laughs> well, what I think you really got right or, you know, was really um, put me there, just not just the rhythms, but the, the descriptions that you used of the landscape and the weather and the slipperiness and the smoke and the smell of the river and the river itself of being sort of this lifeline through London and, you know, paralleling that with the work of the arteries and the blood and all of those other ways of that aren't necessarily their language, but they're so visceral. And that helped me get into the story and be in that place. So, you know, and that's where I think the combination of you as a writer and you as a painter come together to create this atmosphere. Was that fun? Was um, that harder? I think, um, I, I think writing a 150,000 word um, first <laughs> draft um, helps. And then you, and then you kind of carve it down and yeah. um, uh, again, I, I go back to the word thriller. I, I, I hope the description doesn't slow things down, but yeah. I do. Mm -hmm. I do think of, you know, I, I, I like to be um, put into a place in in a book um, in order to to accept, you know, what what's going on. There's a very successful novelist, um, especially in the UK. Um, her, her books are, are written slightly later than mine. I, I won't say who it is um but there's very little description and you you the, the, there are lots of horses and stables and they're, they're always talking in taverns but but hardly anything gets described and and it's this sort of strange dreamlike experience I, I found it quite interesting kind of kind of reading through because as, as the reader you, you are completely thrown back on yourself to to imagine these spaces that they uh, that they inhabit i um i, I like to put um but at least two or three sentences to uh, to, to say where somebody is or, or what something looks like, and um, if you've if you've kind of overwritten in the first in the first instance, you can then carve that back or, or you know combine three sentences of description into one and, and hopefully keep the best of the of the three of them. Um, but the, you know that that the, there was a lot there was a lot going on. I find London fascinating. Um, as, as it was being rebuilt after the the, the great fire um, and so imagining these spaces and, and obviously you've got recourse to to, to maps um, Robert Hooker another one of his um, uh, well, his main occupation as far as making money uh, he was the surveyor to the city of London um, and helped to rebuild London after the fire and he, he's supposed to have surveyed personally at least half of the um, destroyed buildings as, as he um, worked out you know where, where people were going to be allowed to to rebuild and, and what what's um, belong to whom um so um his his architecture as well i i based a lot of scenes in, in the story in, in um, buildings that hook built so so it, it just kind of suggests itself as a, as a very very rich place and the, the more you you read about it uh, and things, you know, 
like like the, the the water wheels under the under the London Bridge, the the Morris water wheels that pumped water up to as far as Cornhill. But I, I I didn't know anything about those until I until I sort of researched the uh, uh, you know research for the book. Uh, the, the fact that um, going from one side of the bridge to the other by boat was was perilous because of the tide, you know, the water surging through the the bridge's starlings and all these kind of, of things. It, um but there's so much um detail and um and, and also difficulty and, and danger of living in 17th century london but um you know with with, with very little street lighting it must have been a, a perilous and scary place if you if you were traveling around after dark uh, particularly and you know I, I find it i find it maybe it's just just the length of time that i've, I've inhabited it but i i find it an an easy place to um to, to think myself into and um, uh, and hopefully my, my descriptions kind of uh, you know could, could convey convey my enthusiasm for the uh, for, for the 17th century city and they certainly added to the suspense and the thrill of what was happening at the moment without giving anything away but there were some moments where if you hadn't described it it would have just been okay but you could feel you could feel the slip and the slide that said, there's always the tension between description and action. Yeah. Like that, and I'm guessing that the writer we are not talking about uh, describes less so that the has a faster momentum for the story. Um, but I think for what you're writing, I think a lot of readers want both. Um, I was thinking, I was just going to ask you a couple of questions about background. You know, a lot, your book's been compared a lot to The Alienist. An instance of the finger post, name of the rose. Were there any other? Is there any other book you'd like to call out that, not not in terms of hook, but in terms of when you were reading, you said, "I want to write a book like this." You know that uh, maybe well, the, 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 there was um, Peter Ackroyd's book Hawksmoor, um, the, the, and, and these all came out kind of late nineteen nineties, early two thousands. There was instance of the finger post. Uh, there was Hawksmoor. Uh, Lomprier's dictionary um, is is one of my my favourite um, uh, favourite books. Um, what else was there at the time? Um, Foucault's Pendulum for me, rather than Name of the Rose. Um, but uh, you know, the, the, they all came out at, at about the same time. And uh, when I started writing, you know, I I just read them. So so I I, um, I I don't think my book is as dense as any of those um the name name of the rose um umberto echo almost tries to put you off especially the first part of the of the book you know um got He's an of academic, and you know. lots of lots of long words you know it's, it's almost like a test um but that you 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 get into you, you have to pass before you before you like, like the, the you know the keeper of the library he he, he won't let you in until you've uh, uh, established your credentials um but but you know I, I think mine is mine is an easier read uh, I, I i didn't aim to be um I, in, instance of the finger post you know is, is is a very dense book um compared to mine it, it's lovely to be compared with these these people and and you know i i, I accept that um uh gratefully um i i, th I think this is a slightly a slightly different book I, I modelled it weirdly on the Odessa file, which is an utterly um, different book to it to any of the ones we, we've mentioned, um, because I wanted to know how a thriller worked. So I, I really analysed the uh, the Odessa file. Um, I, I remember uh, Bernard Cornwall saying that with his first novel, he he looked at the Hornblower novels to to see how they worked, you know. And um, I, I, th I thought I'd do something similar with the with the Odessa file and. And it amazed me actually how little action um, that there is in the Odessa file when, when I've read it. And if you've seen the film a few times, you know, you, you think it's action packed. It, it's interesting when you actually, actually break down a book. Um, perhaps it was a bit of a, a mistake to do that because, because I, I ended up being a bit trammeled by, by um, Frederick Forsyth's structure. I, I, I tried to uh, copy it too much, and, you know, even down to chapter lengths and so on. Um, but, uh, but but characters um, start to have a life of their own. So if you, if you do a, um, 
you know, a, a detailed plot without knowing your characters. Um, I think you're you're um, you're aiming for trouble. Um, you, you'll, you'll end up in trouble. Uh, I've I've planned. Um, well, book book two is written. I've, I've just done a a, a, a redraft, and, and hopefully, you know, um, hopefully it's, it's pretty close to being um, published publishable. By, by the, the copy editor at um, Carl at uh, Melville House might, might disagree, but I'm hoping that's that's quite near the end. We won't book ask three him. Is, is, say again. We won't ask him. If he's ready. Okay. <laughs> book, book three, um, I, I planned um, very carefully. It's probably a 10,000 word plan, but I, I know I know my characters now. So 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 when I'm sort of sketching out a chapter, um, I, I can think, well, what what would Harry Harry do? Or what would Hook Hook's response be? Or you know, um, so so it's it's I'm still still very much a planner. But, but I, I certainly wouldn't rely on somebody else's blueprint because that way madness lies. Yeah, um, I just was, um, there's, first of all, I just want to give a little more of an advertisement for this book. I just want to say, especially people who sometimes read ebooks, or something like that, beautiful book, beautiful, beautiful cover, beautiful end papers. And we don't see that many beautiful end papers in books anymore. And um, signs, sign so, yes, and chapter headings that Lisa and I were talking about with the beautiful illustrations. Um, just they just put poured a lot of love into this book. It is a book that deserves um, a physical copy. You can also you can read the ebook, but then keep the physical book. Um, I also just wanted to ask you it's such an interesting story about this because obviously, as you can only imagine. We know a lot of people who have published their own books. Um, it is very rare that a book that is uh, that you publish yourself finds its way to a publisher, a traditional publisher. I was, I, I, I heard this story about how a bookseller at Green Apple, Martin Sorensen, um, recommended it to somebody at Melville House. So um, I always need to um, give a. Uh, heads up to, or, you know, thumbs up or a uh, celebratory Hosanna, whatever, to a bookseller who helps a book. Um, I know the second you know, book. Do I have I owe, one? I owe Martin ever, ever, ever such a lot. My, my book was, was languishing and sold, sold through Amazon, you know, having used Create Space to, to create the paperback. But the Kindle was actually produced by my literary agent. Okay. Um, and um, you know it it, it um, didn't bother the charts the, or, the, or the top of the charts too too much. But um, Christopher Fowler um, uh, he he talked about it on on Radio Four one day, um, and I, I got this amazing telephone call from my daughter in in uh, high high excitement, saying you've just been mentioned on Radio Four, and this was um, you know a, a, absolutely stunning. And um, um, Christopher Fowler also spoke about the, the first two books um on on his blog and you know suddenly sales went up through through the roof and um and it was incredible and, and then it all died down again and then apparently martin Sorensen at green apple books uh in in san francisco had had gone to um dennis johnson um owner of uh, melville house or, or, or co-owner um suggested it to him and, and I got this incredible email just before Christmas last year from someone called Dennis Johnson and, and you know something called Melville House and, and um, saying he, he, lo he loved the book and, um, and and I was thinking well thank you very much that's kind of you to say and uh, and then at the end he said and, and we'd like to publish it and uh, so so it's it's down to Christopher Fowler and it's it's down to, to Martin Sorensen uh, uh, and obviously luckily for me Dennis um, you know a, a agreed with them uh, so so much so that he's um, he's, he's invested in it um, and, and and published the thing which is you know I, I do feel like I've won the lottery I, I think I, I believe it is a sort of fairly rare story um, I think publishers tend to like their stories kind of fresh don't they and mine's been out there for a while but um, I'm, I'm very grateful to buck the trend. You know, every so often a book appears that 
takes off that's got some, uh, you know, some history to it, I should say, and you do in both senses. Does this, has this led to interest in the third book from traditional publishers in Great Britain or are we the still- third book? Yeah. Um, well, my, my contract says that um, I, I have to show Melville, Melville sure. House the third book. Um, and then maybe they'll they, sell. They've agreed to publish the first two, um, and, and obviously, if, if all goes well, and, and and if they if they like the third book, that's the other um, hurdle to, to to get over. Um, you know, hopefully, uh, hopefully things will will continue. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, especially when I see the quality of the product itself, um, the, the the book itself it is. I, I still I still marvel at it. You know, I've, I've had a month or so to to get used to it, and. I've got them hanging around my house, and, and I, you know, I still, I still stroke them lovingly. Oh, um, it's beautiful! <laughs> it's the, you know, the, 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 the interior design, the, the jacket design. The uh, can I show you what my favourite bit is? Oh yeah. Um, it's it's the silver lettering on on the spine. Oh, when you take the jacket off, you see. And I just, you know, I, I, it's just I, I feel like I've I've won the lottery. So. Um, you know, I've got the I've got the designers. Um, there, there's uh, Marina and, and Best Day at Melville, and um, uh, the 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 interior was was designed by Richard Oriolo, and you know they, they, these are people who who I I will love forever. <laughs> I also want to congratulate you on being named one of the best mysteries of the year by Publishers Weekly. So that was really cool. Um, yeah. Yeah, that, that was um, that was incredible, um, mm. and um, you know, it's getting it's getting on a few lists. Um, uh, just today, Crime Reads have put it as one of their um, best his, best historical fiction. Um, yeah, I mean these these are things that are sort of out, completely outside my control. Once the thing's out there, you you obviously wish wish for it. Um, I, 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 I've got some great press. Um, the uh, you know the the, the Times um, in in the UK and the, and the Daily Mail and the, the New York Times and the Washington Post. I, I couldn't have dreamt of um, uh, of any of this, um, e e even knowing that, that you know I now had a publisher and um, it's it's extraordinary. And, um, it's fun. Uh, the, the Strand Bookshop in New York had it as their mystery of the month, um, and and it's you know it, it's it's phenomenal. It's a bit surreal because I'm in this very quiet little bit of South Wales and in in amongst the hills, so all, all this is kind of going on. Um, we 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 played the game. I've got two boys, um, Stand Eleven and Vix Eight, and we played the game of name an American city, and they they. Um, but I think their geography of the US and their knowledge of the US is better than mine. Um, and, and we were looking at bookshops and, you know, seeing and checking stock and, and it's it's everywhere and it's quite extraordinary. So, um, you know, it's, uh, I, I'm a very, I'm a very lucky and very grateful man. Lisa, what's your next question? Well, there were some characters within the story that I were really, I was really interested in. One of, and the two were the um, fencers in green that appeared throughout the book. But you want to talk about Hortense uh, Mancini? Is it Mancini? Hortense, Hortense Mancini. Yes. Um, and the king's yes, daughter, well, who I've lost her name. Um, the king, King Charles II. Um, wanted to marry her but before the restoration so in, in the 1650s before he was allowed back into into England uh he, he wanted to marry her but but he was too poor so she turned him down um and she's she's uh, one of the um Mazarin um, nieces there were, there were five sisters uh they, they were all the cardinal Mazarin's nieces and they all married kind of extraordinarily and they, they all had extraordinary lives I'm I'm absolutely in love with Hortense Mancini, um, so much so that she's she's a major character in in book two. Um, so she's she's just my kind of girl, really. Um, she she was uh, you know horse riding, sword fighting, and caused a scandal by swimming naked in the Serpentine in in London. Um, a gambler, a drinker, um, probably a smoker as well. I'm not sure. And um, you know she, she she's a great uh, larger than life character. 
she she had adventures all over all over Europe. But at this time, she was in London, um, li living off a pension from Charles II. He had many mistresses that he that he kind of set up and uh, uh, and, and paid for. She was estranged from her mad husband. Um, but he, even after she died, she continued to have adventures because her, her husband had a body preserved and, and put in a coffin and, and took her on his travels as, as he went all over all over Europe. So a, a quite extraordinary uh, story and uh, slightly bananas and, and something that appeals to me uh, very much. So she's, a, you know, I, I have to downplay her on the page because uh, she, she, she just seems implausible when you when you write her as she was. And, and it's these, it's characters like this. And, you know, if my science class started with um, with the the experiments and all of that history, it would have been so much more interesting. And if if the history of the 1600s was started with Hortense, I would have been enraptured. <laughs> but the, we didn't. <laughs> the early Royal Society, I, I find really, really mm -hmm. fascinating. Um, mm -hmm. Partly because you know so, so much was was going on, and so, so many ideas were, were there. But partly the, the the way that they they had their weekly weekly meetings. But Hook, um, he he kind of did did everything, and that he, he he wasn't a specialist. He he uh, you know nowadays you would specialize in a particular um, niche or a, avenue of um, investigation, wouldn't you? Um, he he did everything. So he he was a um, you know I've, I've I've talked about astronomy and microscopy, but um, horology he did, he did all the, the air pump thing. Um, he he um, he had a, a detailed theory of memory that um, computer scientists will look look back at now. And um, uh, paleontology. He was a he was a fossil collector and had all sorts of theories about. Uh, evolution and the end of species, which which was you know, obviously against the biblical uh, and the accepted account, then, which which I, I find interesting. Um, so so he had he, his actual list of inventions, the things, everything from sash windows to um, um, a, a wave wiser, a, a quadrant for a telescope powered by clockwork, so that it could track a star, um, a, a reticle to, to to aim cannon with. Um, uh, umbrellas, you, you know, he, he just just a sort of mad mad scope to the to, to the man. So um, uh, if I don't, I don't know, I think probably disadvantages of teaching science through through characters, but but I think that you probably could do worse than than start with Robert Hooke and say, you know, this 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 is what he did. Mm -hmm. um, in, in the 1650s, uh, they did all sorts of experiments with suspension for carriages. Um, so he he came up with a suspension system. Um, for, for, for you know London London um, Hackney cabs and so on. Um, so it, it's, it's part of the thing about the, the, the early Royal Society, well, and, and the Royal Society now is, you know, they, they looked to improve people's lives and they were looking at very practical um, solutions, you know, to, to make people's lives better rather than, um, you know, ab abstract theorizing that, that they, they wanted to. Um, uh, improve things and, and, and also sort of mysteriously um, he, he reckoned he invented 30 several ways of flying and, I, and I, there's no detail about this so that in, in my sort of fictional version Harry's, Harry's um, tested Hook's, uh, Hook's glider but there's, there's no these sort of tantalizing glimpses of things that, um, that, Hook, uh, that Hook did um, so yeah you, you, know, you could you could um, all, all his meteorology and the, the fact that the monument was a giant scientific instrument it was a giant zenith telescope and and each step was exactly six inches high so that they could do experiments in, in barometry you know with, with altitude and, and obviously gravity as well they could drop things from different heights in, inside the, the, the monument um as well as use it as a, as a parallax telescope to try and judge the distance to um, a star, he chose Gamma, um, Gamma Dr Draconis. Um, so, so, you know, he, he's, um, I'm going on a bit, aren't I? He's a fascinating bloke. And, um, <laughs> well, he's he, he giving you, you know. let me just say he's giving you a lot of fodder for future novels. <laughs> um, and I was, yeah, we were talking, um, yeah. 
so much to go. And Royal Society is so influential today. You know, I it's funny, I just before we got on the call, I took a customer order and I was looking up books for him and trying to find, uh, to my dismay, not so well, um, The Adventure of Nature by Andrea Wolf, which won the Royal Society Book Prize. And we're selling mm -hmm. um, Entangled Life, the Merlin Sheldrake book, which is actually the current winner. They continue to have. It's a major award for us, you know, in the store and uh, continues to have influence today. And if we didn't have a hook, they might, it, the society <laughs> might not have survived, it sounds like. Yeah. So. Yeah. That, that was the thrust of my thesis anyway, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, they, I believe they, it. They passed, and then they I wouldn't passed be selling me for it. So. <laughs> Take it in. So we wouldn't be selling the books if you didn't survive. So thank you, know, so it's a good thing. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Lisa, do you have a class question? Or I think Pauline? I don't have a last question. I'm just thrilled. To, and I think this is a great mystery to recommend. It is a great thriller. I didn't see a lot of the twists and the turns. And I also withheld myself to not reading the end first. So that says a lot. Yeah, I think it's a little, you know, it's funny because you're like, I'm not as dense as those other writers. But I do feel that there, that this book is, um, what is the, op the, the positive way of saying dense? It's a meaty historical yeah. thriller. And I, you know, I think back to all these successes we've had in the past, and I do feel publishers are a little afraid of them. And um, they shouldn't be, because my I know that my customers still want to read them. And I think Lisa feels the same way. And so yeah. we're thrilled to have this book to sell that. It's just, a, it makes you want to go to London. No, I don't really know. Um, Yes, thank Paul. That's putting it on our to be read list. Um, I, I don't know um, if I could. I, I asked this to a to an author who wrote a book about 1890s New York, and I said, if I was going to tour places from your book, where would I see in New York? And she said, actually, nothing. You'd have to like there's one church. You'd have to go to Newport, Rhode Island. If I wanted to do a bloodless boy tour of London, what would be the number one spot for me to see? Um, strangely enough, I, I did this the other day. I, I, I went to London. Um, where where London Bridge used to be is uh, is slightly to the east of, of where London Bridge now is, and you've got St Magnus the Martyr Church, which which was the original entrance to um, the, the north end of the bridge. And then there's a short walk up the hill up Fish Street, which takes you to the monuments. And then it's a short walk up Grace Church Street onto Bishopsgate Street um, to uh, Tower 42, it's the, the HSBC Tower now. And, and that's where Gresham's College was. And then you can go off into all the little lanes nearby where all the coffee houses Robert Hooke used to, used to be. There's the, the Leadenhall Market, which is, which is still there. So there, there's Cornhill and, and everything is within this kind of square half mile. And, um, not not so many places still exist that, that the hook would have um, would would still recognise apart from the churches, uh, but all the all the, the the street names and lane names the, the basic topography is is all still there. So there's uh, there's plenty that you could you could go and look at. Um, sadly, Hook's own buildings um, uh, have all either burned down or or been pulled down. Um, the, uh, the the Bethlehem Hospital that he, he built across Moorfields, um, Bedlam, of course, um, which which appears in my book three. Um, you know all, all, all these sort of major major projects, the Fleet Canal that uh, that he oversaw, where where the Bloodless Boy is is found. You know that that's all been um, uh, roaded over. Um, Farringdon Road now runs over the top of that, so that's all gone underground. So, so kind of Hook's Hook's um, own achievements, apart from the monument and, and St Paul's Cathedral's dome, which which is a, a large part of, um, you know, very very little of, of of his actual building still exists, sadly. But that that's where I take you a tour, a tour around the city, Daniel. Okay. Cool. Well, Patricia said she's looking forward to number two, and Michael mentioned uh, the memorial to the Great Fire should still be there. He thinks so. Yeah, um, the, the monument. Yeah. 
Well, Lisa, would you like to close? Well, thank everybody. I thank everybody for coming tonight or today. We're not at night yet. You're at night, um, Robert. We are still in the daytime. But thank you all for coming. It's Very nearly my past. bedtime, Lisa. Yeah, mm. <laughs> well, it's past my bedtime, your time. <laughs> so thank you all for coming tonight. We're excited to um, recommend this to everybody. And if you are looking for a gift, we really think this would be the one to give. So thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, you for so much, us. Lisa. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Daniel. And thank you for having me on. It's, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. And uh, I, I love your enthusiasm for it as well. It's much appreciated. Well, thank you. And thanks to everyone who joined us. We wouldn't have bookstores without you.